soon here. Good evening, everybody. It's a, it was a beautiful day. Hope everybody had a chance to step out at least for five minutes. Uh, we're going to get started with our meeting today, September 22nd. We're going to call the meeting to order at 6.03 uh, tonight. Welcome all um, reception of guests. Uh, welcome to our guest. I know a few people have already mentioned that they want to speak. Uh, please raise your hands and uh, everybody please try to have your uh, muted so that everybody can hear and we don't have any background noise if possible, please. Um, let's get started. Um, let me see here. I public comments. Natasha, go ahead. Good evening, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank Jen for taking time to speak with me the other day about ESSER funds and how they were going to be used. Um, and also thank you for the email and your response um, in terms of my, my question about um, the school participating in the Day of Action on October 14th. Um, but the reason why I want to speak this evening is because I received the life touch photos for my kids. And um, this is something that I've brought to the attention of their previous school district as well. They are constantly being photographed in incorrect lighting. And so their pictures never turn out correctly and they always have to get re, um, redone. And so I would request that when working with Life Touch or anybody else, that there's a photographer that understands how to fo photograph kids, brown and black kids, so that they're not appearing in the shadow and we can actually see our children's faces when they have their pictures taken. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Hi. Who is Sorry. this? Could you please identify yourself? Chris. Sorry. That's Chris. Chris. Oh, Chris. Chris. Okay, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Can you mute yourself or were you trying to say something? Thank, just wait a minute. I, I, thank you, I, Natasha. There's... Just trying to let you know I was here. Okay, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank now you. we have we have quorum. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Natasha, thank you for your input. We'll, 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 we'll look into that. Thank you very much for making, it, making us aware. Okay, uh, let's move on. Any agenda revisions from board members? I don't see, I don't, I don't see you. I don't see everybody, but I, I'm assuming there's none. Please speak up if there is any. Laura, it's not a revision. <clears throat> I was wondering if, I know the chat is completely disabled, if it could be where we can chat to the host. Sometimes when my internet's getting a little wonky, I like to let the host know that I've, and I just, do a private one, or if somebody's unmuted, I might say, can you let so-and-so know? But right now you can't chat to anybody. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mark, can you get on that please? So it should be able to chat to you and to Jen and myself co-hosting. Thank you, thank you, Lindy. Uh, I would like to add, if it's okay with the board, at the very end, if we get through it, uh, a report, we, we just forgot the board had asked for a report in the Career Center and the VSBA, and I have just very, very short uh, reports in both. If we get through the agenda, I'll include that, if that's okay with the board. Just to highlight, okay. So moving right on, board retreat de debriefing. I'm going to open it up for 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 Jen to walk us so, through. Yeah. All right. So good evening, everybody. Um, when we last had the retreat, we had been going through the ping pong protocol to talk through um, your analysis of where you were relative to your goals and where we might be relative to the implementation report. And you all had the chance to report out on a next step. And then we ran out of time. So I've been thinking about the work that you did, what you expressed, and, um, and the logical next steps. And I essentially have a proposal, which is that when I read what you all were writing about, 
to me, most of what you were thinking about was uh, needing to stick with the three goals you've identified, so around long-term planning, um, community engagement, and student achievement, but to really write SMART goals in each of those three areas. That seemed to be a theme. The other pieces that came out of that in terms of, for example, strengthening internal trust, connecting with your buildings, I think those are going to emerge as you get more specific around the writing of SMART goals. So that would be my, um, that would be my thought right now. I didn't want to assume that you or any person in the community uh, understand what a SMART goal is, because uh, although we throw that word around a lot, sometimes in the world of education or business, we use uh, language that can be alienating just because we throw acronyms around and we assume that people know what we're talking about. So to break it down just quickly, um, a goal should be specific. And um, there's some tightening up to do in, in your current goals, in my humble opinion. So really the who and the what, you um, want those goals to be measurable. If they're long-term goals, then to be able to create some benchmarks along the way to check in and make sure you're on target would be helpful. You want them to be attainable, so realistic and reasonable. Um, you want them to be relevant. So when you think about overall, um, what we're trying to accomplish in Washington Central and your roles and responsibilities as board members, you want the goals to be relevant. And then again, um, really time oriented with a deadline. So there are um, templates that we could uh, use a common template with some guiding questions, some of which are um, somewhat similar to the growth coaching model that I've talked to you about in the past. And, um, and my recommendation would be that we uh, break down into some smaller working groups. Uh, each of each small working group tackle a goal that is sort of speaking to you. And then we bring those back for, um, for feedback and uh, final drafting together at the next board meeting. So I am open to your thoughts and feedback about that process, Floor, anything that you wanna add. It, you know, Jen, you explained it all perfectly. It, so it, it, we just want a feedback from you. We don't want to assume that that's what you wanted to do. That was our intent. But so if we have, uh, you know, thumbs up that this is what you all feel, or if you have some feedback or clarification questions, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, Kari? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, and I'm, I'm, uh, I think we should volunteer the Student Quality Committee to draft the Student Achievement Goal. Do we have agreement with that? Could you guys just lift your hand or thumbs up? Okay. Uh, Stephen, I don't see, I want to make sure that I, Stephen, look, I'm looking at you. I think you it would be appropriate to that committee draft a recommendation, okay. not draft the goal. Okay. Okay, so at quad committee, at quality committee, we'll draft the student achievement. Um, any other comments or clarifying questions from board members? I don't see any other questions. Uh, would it be uh, would it be appropriate for maybe the finance committee to do a long term try to come up with a correct commendation for a long term goal? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So finance a recommendation for long term. And then if we break another small group, we don't really have a community engagement uh, group yet, but if we could break a, a little group for that, yeah. or uh, join us. Maybe the agenda group could work on that. Okay. Okay. Jen, 
Jen, do you, do you want to? Yeah, so that all sounds great. And um, I, when I, you know, when I've done the growth coaching, there's a question in there um, that it's the T for ta tactics and it's exactly how and when will this happen, right? So now we've identified how, but it, um, I, I would, I would invite you to um, to decide when you're going to do this at the end um, and have a deadline so that we can come it back, come back to it with a whole group. Otherwise, uh, my concern would be that it would go on and on. So what I would invite you all to consider is at your next meeting, you put this on the agenda as one of the things you're going to do. And then um, we commit to bringing back the drafts in preparation for the next regular board meeting, the third week of October. That something that feels realistic to everybody. I'm seeing yes. some nod. Yeah, I see a lot of nodding. Okay. I I have a proposal just because I, I had different plans for the agenda planning committee, and Kari knows this. So I I was hoping the agenda committee could take on um, the superintendent evaluation with uh, with Kari uh, chairing that. So. I'm wondering if you guys would be open to maybe having our newest board members lead the community engagement uh, goal. Would that be okay, uh, Jonas? Or, or if you wanted to join them with, or, or I, I don't know. That, does that sound good for you guys to yeah. come to us with a recommendation? Yes? Yeah, I mean, as a new member who's, I don't think, on a committee yet, unless I miss yeah. something, I would be happy to take that on. Um, it might be useful to have one experienced member kind of working with us. <laughs> be helpful. But. Could I have a volunteer before I volunteer, Stephen? No. Yeah. I'll volunteer. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> okay. And I would say, yeah, Flora, I'll pop in to say that's the only group of which I'm not, you know, obviously it's not a regular meeting group. So if you wanted to coordinate and I'm happy to provide some guiding questions and templates and support to you all, um, if somebody will just reach out in terms of scheduling that. Okay. okay. Michaela, can you do that? I see you nodding. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Okay, okay great. So Lisa, Lisa, do you have that? So it would be Ursula, McLean, and Stephen. Sorry, I I I kind of lost you. So the agenda steering committee is going to work on a drafting a what goal? Yeah, it, no agenda. Forget about that. Okay. The agenda committee. So you had the recommendation for for a achievement will come from ed quality. Yes, I have that. And then and finance. The finance we'll committee. Them. I got that they will recommend a long-term goal, but I yeah. don't know more yeah. specifically. Okay. Just that. Um, and then uh, uh, the the community engagement goal is going to come from this new form committee. Okay. All right. And that'll be Stephen, Luke, Ursula, and McLean. And I keep saying your name wrong, I believe, McLean. So I'm sorry. Can you repeat it for me again? Yeah, of course. You're not the only one. It's McKaylin. McKaylin. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. My mom's maiden name was McKay, and then she put a Lynn on the end. So McKaylin. <laughs> McKaylin. Okay. So do you got it? This is sorry, McKaylin. Yes. So Stephen, Ursula, and McKaylin will work together on a community engagement goal. Correct. Okay. All right. Jen, back to you. So we have now a date. Yeah, so we can um, we'll embed that in those agendas for the various committees, and uh, and Michaelin will reach out to me to initiate the process of scheduling the meeting of that smaller group. Um, I can provide support and templates and guiding questions, and we can take it from there. I, I think we're good. Okay, and and you can send up to each of those groups the what what a smart goal means, just so that yeah, have it too. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions on this, or we can move on to the community forum debriefing? Seeing none, let's move to 3.2 community forum debriefing. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the input that we got back, Jen, and then we'll move uh, 
Yeah, so we had put that um, feedback form in the, you know, we had linked that, uh, we put it in the chat and we put it on the website. We ended up only getting five responses, um, although anecdotally and informally, I've heard some other feedback. I would say by and large, the feedback was really positive from the folks who provided it. They really appreciated the opportunity to dive a little more deeply into those two topics. They appreciated um, hearing many voices. They had a few, uh, oh, they loved the small group conversations as well. And the um, and I think board members, some of you commented likewise that you appreciated the small groups. Um, they appreciated Flora setting that context in the beginning around sort of um, civil, civic engagement. And um, a suggestion, there were two major suggestions that I would say can plan, um, we can take into account when we're planning future community forums. One was um, that it was a little too ambitious to tackle two topics in one forum. So let's limit one topic per forum. And the second piece of feedback was just a reminder to folks at the very beginning to limit their comments so that we can hear from lots of voices during that time. Um, those were the two recommendations. Otherwise, everything was really quite positive and well received. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank, you. Thank you, Jen. Any questions on that? Otherwise, we'll move into. We put a little memo, uh, Karen and I did, uh, for you guys on uh, some suggestions for the future uh, community engagement. The one that I wanted to talk mostly about right now is uh, just get a yes or no if you guys agree that it would be good to look into the implementation plan. When we gave feedback to Jen as a board, we were all over the place, right? From some graded at two up to seven, right? So we all have a different knowledge of where we are in each of the implementation uh, goals and, and, the, and the strategies that we're using. So we would like to you know, use that as a way to engage the community too and have everybody be at the same at the same level of understanding of what is happening in schools for uh, to make sure that all our kids uh, that we're improving the education of all our kids right and what's going on in each school does that and and that could help us set uh, the parameters for uh, one of the parameters for our budgeting uh, season so it would be you know information for all board members information for community members a good topic of that we could go back and forth with questions and it would help us with the budget too. Is that okay? Is, there, is it confusing? Is there any questions on that? Okay, sounds like we have agreement. Now, uh, as far as topics for future uh, community engagement forums, if, Kari, do you want to talk a little bit about that or just the board in general? Well, I think the idea is that we're looking down the road and seeing what other topics do we want to start planning for. We know how we have the budget coming up, so we think that um, two, two of the months in, in the not too distant future, we're going to be talking budget specifically. But what other ideas might people have at this point? And we can certainly bring this up again um, for discussion. But um, just seeing if there's any ideas at this stage about future uh, community engagement uh, forum topics. Uh, the floor. Yes, Chris. Um, I just just because I, I don't have access to a hand. Um, I would think the uh, curriculum review would be one that we'd want to have community engagement with once we have that on board as to what we're going to do or how we want to approach that. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Diane? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think there's a, there's a couple of natural um, things that are out there for us to explore as well, which one is as part of that superintendent search, I would assume there's going to be portions of it that are community engagement. I also wonder about checking in around our use of ESSER funds and how that's going and uh, checking in with the community around that, as well as um, how our communities are doing in this COVID context as well. 
And so that would definitely, and then I would also remind us that we had said we would put it on our agenda to educate ourselves around um, the Black Lives Movement, as well as the equitable rights of, of all people. And so I think that, I think we should be uh, also including that in our work. Yes. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, and, and we're working, we're, we're hoping to in uh, the next, we've been trying to work on this with Jen, maybe not, maybe the following board meeting, Jen, we, we want to explore again our statement and exactly the work that you're talking about, Diane. So thanks for the reminder. Um, so that's what we had for community debriefing and future engagement topics. If something comes up after the meeting, please feel free to email and and, and let us know what's on your mind. It, you can email Kari, myself, Jen, okay. It, moving down to superintendent search. So Floor, just a quick question. Do we have yes. any dates for these? So we, are, you, we were assuming that we were using the first Wednesday of the month for community engagement. And if we had a, a little bit of board work or board, it, that was necessary on that first, we would do it at the end after the community engagement, but so that we would get in a routine, especially as we're getting into budgeting. In, in the packet, there are more dates for, for budget forums, right? That don't fall in that timeline, but that's, uh, that's what I thought we had agreed on. Is that still a yes? Because those are marked in our calendars already, and then we don't have to try to figure out a doodle ball for, for new dates. Okay, I see heads nodding, so I'm assuming everybody's okay with that. So in the su superintendent search, I wanted to start with sort of a break it in half. I wanted to start with superintendent evaluation too, just to let you guys know that we haven't let that fall through the cracks. What we are thinking right now is that uh, Kari would lead the superintendent evaluation with the agenda committee. He would he will chair that, but that is important work, and it goes hand in hand with hiring a new superintendent. Um, so that's where we are right now. Uh, when he has more information, uh, we'll bring this to our next board meeting, right, Kari? Okay. Yep. So now moving into superintendent search. So in your in your. I, and I'm sorry for that memo that went out that was not gonna, supposed to be part of it, but it, there, there's two proposal, proposals. One is from the, the VSBA and the other one is from Brian O'Regan. For those of you who are not familiar with Brian O'Regan, he's a, he was a longtime superintendent educator in Vermont. He has helped our district through several searches in, in the past. So the, the last two pages uh, were, were from him. And uh, I just wanted to open it up to you guys if you had questions in, in, in what you saw there. What, what we were thinking is that we would, as a board, we would hire, um, uh, you know, not a facilitator, but somebody that, if, uh, that is gonna help us like last time, uh, go through the process. And then we'll delegate, um, this to a smaller group uh, of the board to come back uh, to work side by side with them and come back to do to give us a proposal of how we are going to go about the the search. But it is important to bring this person in uh, first to help us with that with that process and the community engagement. We have some obviously some uh, of what we used the last uh, couple of times, but uh, I think it would be important to hear from you guys what are your yeah, if you if you agree with hiring somebody uh, from outside to start with, and what are your hopes for for this process? This is the first conversation, so don't. Uh, hopefully, you had a chance to read those two. Diane, I see your hand up first. So I don't know about other people's, but the last two pages on mine are blank. So I have the VSBA part, but I don't have the stuff from Brian O'Regan. Oh, it went in a separate email, uh, Diane. I was looking at the separate email, the one where you had the. Um, huh. So you had the the first memo had different information, and then maybe I'm the only one who had that. 
problem. I'll double check and go deeper, but that's what I'm. Okay, and I, I can send I, I can send that uh, back again. Does anybody else was able to to open it? Uh, Where the second page is Pearson Reed? Yes. Yeah, that's Brian. Okay. That's yes. I have yeah. those two pages are in line from Melissa. Yeah. But I guess the first the, the first question is I, I think we all want to hire somebody to help us through this process, right? Yes. So it <clears throat> We, we have a proposal from, from the BSBA. It has, it, the description is, is right there in what the services are. And, uh, and Brian gave us a, you know, like a brief timeline uh, of what, what he was thinking. Yeah, so were, these, were these proposals solicited or did they come out of the, just in response to what people read in the newspaper? No, this this were solicited. We we had said uh, before that we wanted to start looking. So if you look at our board calendar, even though it's not quite perfect, we had said that around now we wanted to start looking. So I solicited uh, from what we have available in the in the state. And to be clear, I, how, Brian, you what? What was the source? I mean, how do you know what was available? And it's surprising we only had two. Yeah, because I just wanted to start the conversation uh, with you guys. I just had to, we, we haven't put, it's a, it, this is not above $15,000. We haven't put a request for proposal. This is just starting the conversation. I went with the two that are, are local. So if, if you wanted to see somebody else, if, you know, I'm happy if that's the feedback that I get from the board, we, we go and put a formal request for proposal out um it's, are we eventually going to put a request for proposal from one of these two entities is that the goal um or are we just trying to figure out whether or not we want to hire someone to pre prepare a process for us to follow we want to we want to hire somebody to help us come up with the process not prepare it for us but collaborate with us to prepare the process so okay. these two are, you know, sort of highly rated. Brian, you know, if I, you know, Brian helped us before knows our district. It, Kari? Um, so I'm, I'm definitely in favor of us uh, hiring a consultant to help with this process. I, what I think we should do is select a small group, a committee of say three to just come up with our process for selecting the consultant and bring that back to the board rather than trying to brainstorm it now just get a, a small group of dedicated folks working on this okay so should we put that in the agenda committee the side by side you know i'm seeing because we would be the ones to meet sooner <laughs> Let, let's do that I think that's fine yeah that works okay everybody okay with that yeah. Okay. Diane, uh, this one is for you. Staff appreciation. I'll let you read it. Nobody. Yeah, and I and I just Jonas, I you're unmuted. Agree, you know. just, Jonas, you're unmuted. Just so you know, <laughs> it was great to hear that. But you know, <laughs> um, I just know this year has been really. Um, 10 times, 100 times more stressful than um, previously, which I would have never thought was possible. Um, it's, it's just nerve wracking and um, just feels like there's a lot more balls in the air. And so I, I'm not saying to do, uh, you know, I, Scott, Scott had mentioned concern about doing appreciation with um, something cutesy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we as a board need to figure out how do we show appreciation for the staff for the incredible hard work that's been going on right now and the um, the way they've been feeling through and keeping kids safe and working to do that. So um, I'm, I don't have any suggestions. I just wanted to be sure we put it on there because I think it's um, just something we need to do now and ongoing, but especially now as pivoting is just a constant this year. 
I, I see a lot of heads nodding and I think you have agreement on that and it's really important. So I, I would suggest that maybe we could have the same appreciation committee we had last year, if that worked for, for you guys, Lindy, Diane, and I forget who else was in that. Christina. Christine, oh, okay. So we can, but, um, we can, yeah. So yeah, Lindy, if, if um, I'll email you Lindy and we'll, we'll have a quick meeting about some ideas and anyone else who would like to join, just let me know. Um, but if not, I'll reach out to Lindy over the next week and we'll, we'll put together some ideas. Sorry. So, oh. okay. <laughs> I just wanted to share one uh, thought, which is, um, I'm not sure exactly where the community engagement um, group is going to go with their work, but one thing to think about is, do we have some core messages that we want to um, communicate consistently throughout the year? And appreciation of our staff might be one of those if that becomes part of the uh, goal of community engagement. That's wonderful. Yes. Um community engagement you take you took notes okay uh, Chris you may speak well I was going to say if they need someone with a partial Chris I'd be glad to join the committee we'll take any Just, part of a Chris we can get so that works okay, okay. And I'll go with Ina. <laughs> okay. okay okay Okay, we got, uh, let's move on uh, to reports. We have the best part of the meeting, student reports, and we're gonna appoint our new student representative. So uh, where are our students? Anna, welcome. Hi, do you wanna start by introducing Maya or do you want us to just start with the report? Well, let's let's start, let's reverse it a, a little bit and let's start with appointing Maya so she can be part of it. And I'm, I'm gonna open this up for Steven to introduce Maya for, for us and then have Maya speak for herself. But just to talk a little bit about the process because not everybody was aware in the call and new board members, that'd be great. Yeah, wonderful, thank you everybody. Um, so. Uh, each year, we uh, I put a call out to all juniors uh, to fill an open seat on the Board of Education because we try to have one senior and one junior um, so that this, they rotate every two years um, off of the board. And um, so I put a call out to all students at the beginning of the school year, and several students inquired about being a part of uh, the school board. And so at that point, we invite them to submit a resume and pretty much the answer, why do you want to be on the school board? And, um, and we went down from about five interested kids to one who was super interested and actually completed all the application materials. And so uh, Maya did not win by default, but she certainly rose to the top of the, uh, the list of people who submitted a full application. And then... Um, I met with her just to go over you know, some of the responsibilities and requirements that we ask of students on the board and provided her with that information. And then uh, she and Anna um, uh, met with me so that, uh, that she could get started on this whole process. Now, who is Maya? Maya is a junior at U32. I'm going to let her tell you about her wonderful accomplishments, but one of the things that I think should, um, should really stand out as we think about students on our school board, she really wants to... Um, participate in the process. Um, and one of the things that she keeps expressing is the, um, the desire to really understand what's going on and, uh, and help bring student voice to a lot of our uh, work. And so I'm gonna let Maya fully introduce herself. And uh, Maya, you ready? <laughs> yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm Maya. I'm a junior, as Steven said. Um, I applied to be on the school board just because I wanted to see what was happening kind of behind the scenes of the school and just help you guys out with student input and give you like the opinions of the students. Um, not really sure what to say other than that, but that's the base of it. Welcome, Maya. We are super excited to have us 
to have you join us and you join Anna too. And, you know, student voice is super important and, you know, students is why we are all here. So I'm going to let a board member make a motion to, to nominate Maya for our new student representative, and then we'll move into the reports. Could I have a motion, please? I, I will move to nominate Maya uh, as the second student representative, but Maya, I'd love to know your last name. Oh, sorry, it's Elliot, Maya Elliot. Elliot, Maya Elliot. Thank you, Jonas. Okay. Chris will second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I think I hear all eyes. Any opposed? I don't see any opposed. Welcome, Maya. We're really glad to have you here. And I'm thinking, listening to what you were saying, that maybe what we should do to do something a little different this year, it, which we want to do with our own board members too, is maybe pair you with a board member. So that, you know, first, both you and Anna should always feel free to email any of the board members, right, with, with questions or with, uh, we're, with input. Uh, but if you already have a connection with any of our board members uh, here and you would want to pick your own mentor, you know, I'm all for a student having <laughs> the, the power to make their own decisions. Or if you want to think about it and, and tell us at the next meeting, uh, that would be, be great too. Do you want to think about it? Uh, I'll think about it and get back to you on that. Okay, that sounds great. And let's let's move on into the reports. And when I mean pair is so that they can mentor you and then you guys can ask more questions. And Anna, you should do the same, right? Okay. Think about it and we'll talk about it later. Uh, let's move into the student reports. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. We can hear you, Anna. Sorry. It's really sort of like underwater and muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna leave my headphones off just so like you guys can hear me, I can hear myself. Okay, so this year has had a lot better of a start than last year. As we all know, we've had no masks, or we've had masks, but we've been outside and not had to wear them. And um, this past weekend, we had homecoming, which was a really big deal for us because we were able to play sports and um, although the girls soccer team who are the state champs did lose, we had a humongous student section and we're really hoping to um, increase our school spirit and just have a lot more people going to the games and playing sports and all of that. Maya, if you want to take the next one. Um, I think you had the next one is about seniors. Okay, yeah, I'll talk about that also. So. <laughs> Um, as you all know, I'm a senior in high school, and it is currently almost October. So for that, for me, that means I've started thinking about my college essay, um, looking at the Common App process, uh, starting to get recommendation letters, and looking into applying to schools. So it's a big time and a very, um, a very busy time for us seniors to start getting ready for life after high school. I'll keep going. Um, surveillance. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> Sorry, there's a delay. So, um, all right. So surveillance COVID-19 testing has begun and many students and teachers are taking advantage of the opportunity. It's in the atrium and anyone can sign up and get tested. Um, I've noticed it's made the, the student body and the teachers feel more safe and comfortable. Um, and it's just kept everyone more safe, so. Okay. Um, I'll go on to another one that's a really nice improvement to have to our school. So in the, I believe it was spring of last year going into the fall of this year, U32 began working Mosaic and um, a little blurb that Stephen put in our newsletter um, and letter to just all um, of the school and community is that 
Mosaic's mission is to heal communities and end sexual violence, and they envision a world with resilient communities free of sexual and gender-based violence where all people are supported in healing from harm. And the goal here is that with working with Mosaic, that the, the school um, will build a culture centering on consent, liberation, and healthy relationships, and Throughout the year, uh, Mosaic, along with a group called The Conversation, which is now a student-like group, they will um, have updates and seminars and workshops that will be going over the course of the year. And this has uh, this past year and last year, um, Title IX became a really big, um, big word in our school because of sexual assault, sexual harassment. Um, so having Mosaic is a really big addition and good improvement to our school. Uh, clubs are also back up and running this year in person, um, including Seeking Social Justice, BLAM, which is Gay, Lesbian, and Many More, BLAM, which is Black, Latina, Asian, and Many More, The Conversation, which Anna was talking about, Green Team, The Chronicle, our newspaper, High School Book Group, Yearbook, Cybersecurity Club, which is new, and also Pep Squad. Adding on to Chronicle, just because it's kind of in my field of things. Um, I'm the senior editor, one of, one of two senior editors of the Chronicle, and we're hoping to publish a lot more this year and have a bigger group. And if any of you school board members are interested in telling your story of how you got to the school board, I would be more than happy to interview you. Or if you have any stories to share about the community, or if you're alumni from the school, that'd be uh, really cool to write about. And our website is hopefully up and running again. It crashed, but it should be good now. Um, along with school being back to normal, it, we are eating in the cafeteria now. Our, um, our lunch, our school lunch and school breakfast is up and running. As most of you might know, it is um, free for the basic meals, which is really, really nice for us as students. Um, and they're in the middle school recently, and you can see this in the newsletter, in the middle school there was expert day. And that is where um, a lot of people in different careers came in and they sort of showed the middle schoolers, you know, what it's like to be in the adult world. And it's been a good start to the year so far. And finally, the theater and music program is back up and running with in-person uh, meetings. Um, auditions for the play were held last week. It, it's, it's called Six Bi Very Busy Days, which is a modern Romeo and Juliet. The cast and crew are enjoying it a ton, as I've seen. Um, it's the first time that they've been in person for nearly two years, which is a lot. Theater on, on Zoom is definitely difficult. Um, and the performance will be taking place on November 13th, just in case anyone is interested in that. Thank you for listening to our Is that it, Anna? Yeah. Thank you both. Any questions from board members? Say no. Okay. Thank you for your nice reports. Uh, let's move on into Superintendent uh, COVID update. Jen? Sure. So I'm going to share some of the um, numbers and key points with you, and then I'm going to invite Maria to. Uh, fill in the gaps a little bit and we'll answer questions to the best of our ability. So Maya had just spoken about surveillance testing. Um, we started last Monday the 13th. We had 437 people uh, test participate uh, that yielded one positive result. On September 20th, we had 100 more people participate, so about 537, um, also yielding a positive result. We are thrilled that we had 437 people start and 100 more, and we want more and more folks to participate. It's a really important uh, mitigation and information strategy for us. Last Thursday, we asked um, the families of our students who are 12 and up to complete an attestation form regarding their vaccination status. We can use this information. As you know, the Department of Health um, differentiates its response uh, regarding close contacts uh, if for student, uh, students and, and staff who are quarantined, uh, who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And as of a few hours ago, 
we had 240 people who had um, had returned that survey to us out of about 754. So we have a ways to go. We will continue when I write in my community letter, um, I will ask folks again tomorrow to fill that attestation out. And I am sure that Stephen will uh, plug away as well. We have a few 12 year olds in our elementary schools, but by and large, this is the U32 thing. Um, but we really want to be able to, um, to have that information at the ready so that when we need to do contact tracing, we can uh, differentiate that response. Uh, along those lines, as you may well be aware, the Agency of Education has been revising its guidance and actually right before, I'm about three o'clock this afternoon, I received a, a new revised guidance statement from the Agency of Education, which will ultimately inform and, and impact our practices when we achieve an 80% vaccination rate at U32. In the 2021 school year, we had seven cases of COVID the entire school year. Uh, as of today, we've had 19 cases in our schools already. Um, the schools that have been impacted are East Montpelier, U32, and Berlin overall. As you know, in the community letter I sent last week, I asked folks um, to give me feedback about the idea of reporting on a weekly basis in that community letter versus letting the entire community know each time in each case. I heard from a few folks, not many, but what I heard was um, people preferred the weekly. I am exploring the idea actually that Kari gave to me about a uh, maybe a dash board on the website that's a little more updated. Um, so I'm, I have not started that practice, but I'm thinking about it if we can manage it. When we have cases at the elementary school, um, it is all hands on deck. It's a huge effort. And I have to say, by and large, Diane, I was heartened to hear you talk about staff appreciation. We always appreciate our staff. Our staff is working so hard. We remain uh, short staffed before subbing in for each other when they can. And then even then we're short staffed again. So, um, and when it comes time to contact tracing and needing to uh, dismiss students, again, it's all hands on deck in a time that is stressful. So I wanna emphasize um, just how greatly we appreciate the staff and, um, and their flexibility and creativity because those moments are hard. Um, Last, this past Monday, just two days ago, it feels like a week or two ago, um, we had a, Maria and I had a conference call with the Department of Health. We expressed some of our questions and concerns primarily about the role of the Department of Health with uh, helping us out in contact tracing, knowing that they too are short staffed and overwhelmed. Um, we're, we anticipate some changes in the Department of Health that will help create a designated person at the DOH for us to talk with. We also expressed concern that um, when we have to send kids for testing, um, we need to wait until we can achieve the 51% attendance rate to have kids come back, as was the case at Berlin. And if the DOH is telling us it's taking three to five days for testing, um, that hugely impacts our schools, especially our elementary schools. So um, that was a positive uh, move in terms of that conversation. We have determined that, um, that because we experienced more than three cases at Berlin, that um, we are completing an outbreak code request for the Department of Health. They'll um, do some further research and contact tracing. They determine whether or not there's been in-school transmission. So in the days and weeks to come, we'll have more information from them that's not for us to determine. Um, you know that Berlin engaged in a period of learning from home, and I don't know if David Delcor is here or not, but David and I had a long conversation about why it's learning from home and not remote learning, and actually a bit of a chuckle because he was telling me that that phrase was rolling off my tongue. Again, remember right now that when we get to a place where we can't meet the student attendance uh, requirements of 51%, those days do not count. We made that decision again at Berlin for the health and safety of our students. Given the information we've received, I'm, I, it was absolutely the right decision. Um, and we did what we did for East Montpelier a few, year, a few weeks ago. So a consistent response, um, taking student attendance, ensuring that students were engaged in learning from home for the state minimum required time and making sure that there were meals available. 
um, for students who needed it. And the other thing I'd say is that the um, staff at, at Berlin also pivoted. And even though the students were learning from home on Monday, they made sure that there was a surveillance testing opportunity outdoors at Berlin for families that wanted to participate. Um, I think that's the highlights for me. I'd invite Maria to add um, anything that she'd like to add to enhance this report. Hi there. I don't, um, I don't have a whole lot more than you said, right? You've got all the facts. Um, I'd love to answer any questions if anybody has any. Um, and we definitely <clears throat> are appreciating our surveillance testing at this time. Uh, I, it, it is really, I think, reassuring um, to know exactly where we are at any given time. Um, I know that parents are feeling a little bit frustrated. I'm getting a lot of messages that say, why are we gonna test our children every week if you're just gonna send them home? Um, and I appreciate so much the frustrations of families who um, can't afford to keep their children home for seven to 14 days at a pop every time we get a positive case. Unfortunately, in terms of keeping people safe, we don't really have another option at this time. So, you know, we just keep asking for people's patience and trying to make sure that we can help in any way we can in terms of food and assignments that can keep kids up to date. Um, but that is pretty much where we are at the moment. Thanks, Maria. So, Flora, if there are any questions or comments from the board? Any board questions? Please raise your hand or press your on the phone. You can speak. Uh, so first of all, thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, and thanks to all of the families who are impacted by these things that are happening. Uh, both of my kids have been home from school and from preschool for the last calendar week. They are negative, but they have colds and we can't have asymptomatic, we can't have symptomatic kids in the school. So even though they are fine, you know, one of the, the little guys sounds like a, you know, a tuberculosis patient just doesn't sound great. Their noses are running, but they're a hundred percent, but we can't send them to school. You know, it's frustrating. I'm exhausted. Um, I get it. Um, so I just wanted to add my solidarity with all the other families that are struggling with having kids in the house when you're trying to be a grown up. It's really, really hard. Um, I see right that next in the agenda, you know, we're going to be re requested to delegate authority to Jen. So, you know, but just before we get there, Jen, I wanted to, you know, ask, you know, what could we be doing? What more could we be doing in terms of in school protocols that we're not doing? Right. The distancing seems to be seems to be one thing. Um, you know, the, the potting of classrooms seems to be another thing, um, you know, exposure during mealtime, you know, um, we've, you know, I think we've all seen communications from, from parents, you know, and in speaking to people in the district, you know, when I pick up and drop off my kid, um, you know, I, I just wonder, and not, not that I think that there is anything that we should be doing that we're not, but I just wanted to ask the question and give you an opportunity to talk about some of the options that we might have that we're not doing right now and why we're not doing them now and why we might do them in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that um, that it's important to know is that we are routinely, um, so after East Montpelier and Berlin in particular, we conducted after action reviews to really make sure we were clear about what, what did we expect to happen? What actually happened? What went well and why? And how can we replicate that? And what didn't go well? And how can we improve? And we're constantly making um, improvements to the, our practices and or sharing uh, practices across the school. So the leadership team, although I think sometimes we think, oh gosh, we have to talk about COVID again. We do have to talk about COVID again sometimes at our meetings and we share practices and even um, there have been staff, a staff member or two who have gone from one school to another to help troubleshoot with a fresh set of eyes at another school around um, the district because we are all in this together. I think that there have been, um, you know, just we need to stay on top of the 
guidance and the conditions, and then we need the flexibility and the patients to, to, to respond accordingly. So I know that there have been some um, community groups that have wanted to gather, for example, and we're pretty strict right now when we're in a, a place of higher substantial um, transmission about only limiting visits to in our buildings to essential visitors, for example. And I know that that is frustrating, but I would seek um, patients and for you all as board members to continue to promote that. Um, everything that we're doing, I think we are doing with as much thoughtfulness and perspective as we possibly can have. Um, and I think that uh, another thing is just to, in, again, help us promote uh, the empathy of how hard it is to stay home and keep ourselves home. Our, we have staff members who have sniffles and they need to stay home too. And that is hard. It is hard to, I mean, to write sub plans when you have a sniffle, when in different times you'd normally just come on in and plow through. That's hard and a lot of work. Um, and that there's a reciprocity there. As hard as we're working at schools, we hope the community will continue to work hard as well so that we can keep our kids in school. I, I will uh, welcome uh, that action in the next couple of minutes regarding delegating that authority. I think it gives um, me and our team here the flexibility that we're gonna need to, um, to make decisions uh, with the health and safety of our kids at the forefront. Th th thank you, Chennai. I appreciate everything, everything you just said. I wanna just make make a comment that um, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, we are coming up on the EUA for vaccinations for five to 11. Um, so I just want the community to know that I want parents and everybody to be prepared for that. I, you know, I would personally, once that happens, I hope that we are encouraging everyone who is eligible uh, to get that vaccination. It is the single most important thing that we can do. Our, our elementary school kids are the ones who are on the front line now. They are gathering in person, in classrooms, and in buildings and in closed spaces all over the country. They are not eligible to be vaccinated. When they do, I, I'm looking forward to a, you know, I will be out there, you know, I'll be out there with a sign on the street encouraging parents to get their kids vaccinated. Yeah, and Jonas, you actually reminded me, Maria, would you be willing to talk about those conversations you've had around organizing as soon as possible? So uh, we are with you, Jonas. We would like to, um, you know, get a water gun and fill it up with a Pfizer vaccine and line up with the kindergartners and just <laughs> run all the way across if we could make that happen. Um, okay. So um, I am talking with our pediatric medical liaison from um, CVMC. Um, so historically, schools have only been involved in vaccine rollouts in collaboration with the state. So we're trying to get an idea of if the state and CVMC, UVM network have already been talking about what the process is going to be for them. Um, I know that the vaccines were available for the 12 plus age group months before any type of vaccine uh, clinic was available at U32, and I'd like to see us if we could move a little faster. The younger age group creates some complexity in terms of um, laws about who can administer a vaccine to children that young and whether or not they would accept a vaccine without a parent present or whether parents would allow their children to accept a vaccine without them being present. Um, which opens up things like, oh, are we letting that many parents in on a school day to the gym to be with their children while they get vaccinated? There's a lot more to talk about than with the older kids at the moment. Um, but we are starting that conversation now, hopefully so that we can be very proactive. I have <clears throat> two concerns that I would just really like the board to be aware of as we start to move forward. One of them is we are very swiftly, both in the country, but also on a macro level more in our own district, um, becoming a system of have and have nots in terms of the vaccine. Um, I'm hearing concerns about it from parents on both sides of the fence. I had a mom today say, well, I don't understand. If you're gonna send my unvaccinated Kim home for seven to 10 days, every time he's exposed, why can't you put a, a place in the, in the classroom where the unvaccinated kids sit really, really far from the vaccinated kids? And that way, and I said, 
oh my dear, like there is no way we are going to create a line like the Berlin Wall in the middle of our school in terms of vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But people are starting to really feel some pressure. And um, if they have chosen not to vaccinate their children, um, and while I have personal feelings about that as a professional, I feel like it's really important to support all members of our community, despite the choices that, you know, whatever choice they're making for their family. But I encourage us to start thinking about how we are going to keep our communities together as the rules are starting to pull us all apart. And that's something I think everybody should be talking about at a lot of different levels. Um, my other concern is that as we are having discussions about how to tighten things up, the Agency of Education is having discussions about how to loosen things up which is going to become very scary and frightening when they tell us um, that we're not doing contact tracing anymore for positive cases. Um, so again, we need to start having conversations about um, not necessarily any sort of a mutiny or anything crazy like that, but I'm starting to encourage people to reach out to the Agency of Education about how difficult things are with families when we don't have a remote learning option about how much income they're learning. I'm encouraging people to reach out to the governor just because we need to have a, we're starting to have a disconnect between the state wanting to keep kids in school and not have a conversation about uh, in-person or remote learning and what we're trying to accomplish within the district in terms of keeping children safe. That is a conversation we need to be continuing to have, I think at all of these levels um, and hopefully we can find a way to sort of bring it all back to a baseline of where we're all kind of at the same place. We seem to be going in different directions at the moment, which is concerning again. And I just want to make sure that we're all having these discussions, um, on a regular basis. So we know, all know what's happening and, um, why we're making decisions the way that we're making decisions. Thank you, Maria. I, I see that Diane has a question. Hey, Maggie, you can go yeah. after. Yeah, so it's it's about um, when you were talking about having kids get vaccinated without their parents. Uh, you might, if we when we get to that point, uh, do a little checking back in our history. And so when H one N one was really nervous, um, you know, we I was on the bus with my preschoolers trekking them to U thirty two without parents. And um, so I'm I'm sure some regulations have changed, but that might be a good system to look back on and um and just pull from because yeah it was um there weren't parents some parents went but it was mainly non-parents that were there thank you diane uh, maggie you have a question i i wanted to second that recommendation and i was a parent at that point and of an elementary school student and put him on the bus from callus to u32 and he received his vaccine i was not present filled out a, a permission slip, that was it. Thank you, Maggie. So, so Laura, I have a question. Yes, Chris. Laura, I'm sorry. Just Go ahead. So uh, a couple of, couple of comments. One is that, um, and Jen and Maria, should we, um, could we hire a contact tracer on our own rather than be reliant upon either the Agency of Education or the Department of Health since it sounds like they're not, they may not be interested in doing that long term. Um, and is there any training that would need to be done? Do they have to have certain qualifications in order to be a contact tracer? Um, so the second is, um, should we be um, getting permission slips out to parents now um, for the for the younger students, uh, even though uh, vaccine is not yet approved. Um, I think the chances are that it is going to be approved within the next several months, but having those permission clips or whatever um, uh, process we uh, think would be best for us to have those already in place and be very candid, not just a vaccine, vaccine for the COVID once it's approved and find out how parents want to proceed with that, whether they want to be present or not present. And the third is, and this is more directed to you, uh, you talked about the um, seeming, if not real, disconnect um, between, and it seems like there's a tension between um, the state level officials wanting to keep the schools open and kids in school um, and how that really works 
in the local level and keeping kids safe and the staff members safe in school. Um, um, it wouldn't be a mutiny, I think. Uh, I think you used the word mutiny. I don't think we're talking about a mutiny, but should we be taking other steps that may not be um, the agency of education's recommendations? Because they really have, I think, deferred or the, the referred the responsibility to local districts to deal with um, the the masking and the and taking care of kids. Because then, you know, I think they're have transferred that that responsibility to us. So are there things that we should be doing now to ensure greater safety for our kids? Especially in light of this apparent divergence of, of um, view or mission. Well, first I can answer that you've already hired a contact tracer. Her name is Maria Malekos mm -hmm. and she needs no further training because she was just thrown right in and she figured it right out in the last four weeks. Um, so the Department of Health has said that um, they are not going to be doing any contact tracing for schools, that schools are doing their own contact tracing. We're well aware of that. Um, we're utilizing school nurses and administration um, as well as myself um, to do all of the contact tracing. So we're on top of that. Um, that is not something that's new. We pretty much knew we were going to be doing that. Um, it just, you know, it, it's a lot more common now than it was last year. So we're just sort of creating new systems to be a little more efficient than we were last year. For example, last year, your average, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. my daughter got her second vaccine last night and she's feeling very clingy and tired and yucky. So I apologize for the yawning dramatic seventh grader in my video. Um, but uh no longer visible right no no I, and now i embarrassed her so she'll just sit under the blanket of course um <laughs> so last year we used to create these line lists for the state and it would take three or four hours because they want race and ethnicity and um address and phone numbers and last day you know they wanted all this information that was scattered across different software systems um it, it was okay to spend five hours on a Saturday doing that when we had one case in that school for the entire year, right? Now that we're having multiple cases a week in various schools, we don't have the same time to make that happen. So we talked to um, the Department of Health. We're working with our IT folks to create a faster way to download the pertinent information for the line list into a template that is um, that is adaptable, that's not the word I want. What's the word I'm looking for? We're gonna turn it into the spreadsheet for the um, Department of Health. So compatible, I don't know what it is. We're, we're yeah. looking at, at making something that's compatible so that we can simply download, upload, and send it to the Department of Health as opposed to manually typing in every single name and address mm -hmm. as we were doing last year. So we're constantly, as Jen said, reviewing our actions from the prior case. How do we get more efficient? How are we, how, how is our messaging getting better and clearer considering the feedback we're getting from families? And how do we make sure that we can do this in a reasonable amount of time um, so that we can move on to the next task at hand? Um, the third question is more concerning if I, if I let me just, uh, rephrase it you're asking so we we did bypass the department of health when they told us we could and we followed the cdc and the aap guidelines because they were stricter than the department of health earlier in the school year the uh contact trace not the contact tracing sorry the attestation of um covid vaccine and how to determine our percentage of vaccinated students in a school um, we are required to follow the state guidance on that. We cannot use the immunization registry. We have to have a voluntary parental disclosure. So we're working on that system because they've told us we don't have a choice in that matter. Um, they've also told us with how we contact trace, we may not use any other systems. Um, so there's a bit of picking and choosing in terms of what guidance they're letting us follow and what guidance they don't want us to follow. Um, and so there's a, again, the disconnect sort of gets a little bit bigger. Um, again, I, I'm not trying to sound super negative, but I think 
you know, we were all a little frustrated that there was no mask mandate that came down from on high. And then Governor Scott put out a press conference that said, look, we didn't put down any guidance and there was no state of emergency, but the schools all told everybody to wear masks. So basically we're universally masking anyway. We got it done, right? Which was, I thought was a bit of a stretch because <laughs> we got it done, right? <laughs> they didn't yeah, get it done. Yeah. So that's sort of, I think where that desk, the disconnect is still kind of there with we're making things work and we're keeping our kids safe but the state is starting to move on. They're changing the definition of close contacts. They're changing the definition of when and where we should contact trace. Um, <clears throat> and that's going to get interesting before, I, I'm interested that as the numbers go higher, they're asking us to do less. I'm getting pressure as I think all of you are from parents and families and the community and staff to do more. So there is definitely a bit of dissonance uh, there. And I just want to make sure that we're all super clear about it so that we can talk about it and figure out as a board and as a, a school, um, all the schools, what, how we're going to handle that um, as we move forward. Thank you, Maria. I, I see we have, it. Chris, can you hold for a minute? It, this is yeah. for, yeah. for one minute. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to let McClay speak first. Yeah. Michaela. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, I guess I just wanted to speak to something Chris said about um, like being proactive and sending permission slips and coming up with our own process. And I just, um, you know, I know there's a lot of, I, I guess I know from our health center in the state that there's a lot of talk about getting kids vaccinated really fast as soon as it's approved. So I just, I would worry about us devoting a lot of time and resources in reinventing the wheel if it's already there. So I have a little hesitancy about that. But I but I thank you for everything you're doing. And it sounds to me um, like so far our, our district is taking the more you know safe route when we can, even when the state's not mandating anything. And um and I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. And then I just want to do a time check with everybody. I want to make sure that we can delegate the authority to, to, to Jen. And, uh, and, and also we've been clear that our, uh, you know, and our duty of care, you know, staff and students are our priorities. So I think we've been clear about that. Uh, Jonathan, please go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question for Maria. I was wondering if you knew whether or not, or if anybody knows whether or not the, the, most recent cases that are that are showing up in the schools are the Delta variant. Do we know that or not? Um, and just just an observation, and that is that the virus, whatever variant or mutation it may take, uh, certainly has no uh, consideration or doesn't care whether or not the governor has has declared a state of emergency or not. I mean, the virus is going to circulate if it has the opportunity to circulate. So that's, I guess, my way of interpreting this disconnect that you're talking about, Maria. Oh, I agree with you. Um, I do know that the Delta variant is the um, prominent variant in the state. My assumption is that with this high transmission, that this is definitely Delta. It's a very different animal than we saw last year in the schools. Um, I agree 100% um, that, <clears throat> like I said, our cases are going up and their guidance is going down. And that's very frustrating. It doesn't feel like it's timely and the right kind of timely. Um, Unfortunately, as a public school, we do have some limits on how far we can just decide to blaze our own paths. And that's where I just wanted to sound some semblance of a minor peak of alarm that this is sort of the, the, the direction we're going in. I don't want anybody to be just, you know, confused by it or surprised by it as it starts, to, as it continues. Um, I want to make everybody aware of the fact that we're, we're starting to feel a little bit left behind. Um, and that's important to recognize because I, I agree with you. It doesn't seem, it doesn't make any sense right now. The virus doesn't care. It has one job, which is to infect more people. And it's doing a wonderful job. Thank you, Maria. So could I have a motion, it, everybody to delegate the authority? Is that possible? Well, let's have a definition of what, what we're delegating. A specific motion that specifies what authority we are actually delegating. 
So it was right on your on your packet. If, if what page? Chris, right in the front, is to delegate the authority to the superintendent to establish reasonable evidence-based safety rules for COVID-19. Okay, so it's right on the, the uh, agenda page? Yeah, it's right on the agenda page. Yeah, we, are, we already operate that way. We just don't have a policy for that. And there's been a recommendation across the state that we delegate this. If something changes, Jen wouldn't have to come back to the board and she can act quickly. So it, I think this makes sense. They are the ones trained in emergency and, and we'll have the latest up to date and information. So is that a clear, Chris? Um, it's, it's, well, it is clear, but uh, it doesn't address the, um, what I'm hearing from Maria, which is the state may be um, issuing guidance that is separate and different and apart from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatric Physicians. If I'm so, understanding that correctly, if I'm not, please correct me. And yeah, so, so we, we, by doing this, Chris, we're not taking that away, right? They they would still, we still we're, made that decision in combination. But we're not doing, well, but I think we may not, this may not take into account is the potential political pressure that superintendents um, may feel to follow state guidance, even if it's less rigorous than national guidance. And, you know, we can always hope that we will follow the more rigorous guidance. I don't know that this necessarily does that. I mean, it, it, it gives discretion, which is fine. I, I, you know, I fully trust Jen and fully trust Maria to do what is in the best interest of our kids. But I'm also not cognizant of the what I think would be political pressure. So Thank that's you. my concern. OK. Thank you. I get it. I understand it. it Jonas? Chris, uh, each of the last three superintendents who have served here during the pandemic have been asked straight up during meetings, would they be willing to go beyond state guidance if they thought those actions would be necessary to protect the safety of, of students? And all three of them have said yes. I think that this gives our superintendent the ability to do that, to be flexible and responsive when things happen. Uh, and I will make the motion that we delegate authority to the superintendent to establish reasonable evidence-based safety rules for COVID-19. Thank you, Jonas. Could I have a second? Second. second. Thank you. Okay. okay. I think we have had enough discussion on this and I'm doing a little bit of a time check. Uh, Steven, you just unmuted. it. Who no? seconded okay. it? Sorry. Who seconded it? So I can it? vote. Okay, good. Uh, Michaela. Thank you. And um, okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, let's move into our Berlin Town Center. Uh, I, want, I want to introduce, well, I'm going to have Nick introduce himself. He's joining us. Sorry to make it a little later that we promised, Nick. No problem. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Lowe. Uh, I'm an attorney based in Montpelier, uh, and I've been helping the board out with this uh, Berlin school land question. Um, and I can just launch right into it, or, or if anyone else wants to introduce it first. So Nick, uh, what we thought we'll do uh, is to just sort of frame the conversation and then let you move into the into the memo uh, and just and, and answer questions. So the board got a chance to look at the entire package and I think they would probably have some direct questions. So as as a board, uh, what we what we've been discussing is what are the interests of the board in, in this land? So the real big question for us uh, tonight, and we don't need to make this decision tonight, uh, this is just to set the foundation for the ultimate decision that hopefully can happen at our next board meeting, is what is the responsible thing for the board to do? And I'm going to invite you. I know that Vera is joining us by phone to be part of this conversation, too. So uh, please. Um, Nick, if you want to move on into just some of the key points of your memo that you think are important, especially that article of agreement, that would be great. Sure. And do you want me to kind of go over the background of the property? Okay. That'd be great. Can I, can I share my screen? Yeah. Uh, Mark, are you able to allow um, Nick Lowe to share his screen? 
Yes, Nick, you should be able to do that now. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, okay, can everyone see this exhibit two that's up here? Okay. Yes. Um, so this is the Berlin Elementary School property at the corner of Payne Turnpike and Route 62 uh, up by the fire department there. Um, and just a quick overview of what the property looks like. Uh, on the, the, so the overall parcel, it's about 25 acres, uh, was conveyed to the Berlin School District in the 1960s. Um, and then when the, car, when the existing Was Washington Central Unified District was formed, uh, it was, the property was supposed to have been conveyed into the, uh, the new district. I, as kind of an asterisk, I don't know if that conveyance ever happened, um, which is something that could be uh, sorted out later if it hasn't. Um, so the property right now, it's improved on the west side uh, with, with buildings, with the school building, the entryway, uh, getting into the center of the property, there's the parking. Um, and then as you move to the east, uh, the eastern half of the property or so is wooded. And running north-south through that, there's a stream. And for those of you who can see this image, there's a light yellow blob around the stream, and the, the stream which is a designated class two wetlands. And the significance of that uh, is that um, that's basically undevelopable property. Uh, you can't build in a class two wetlands or within a 50 foot uh, buffer of the wetlands unless you get a permit from Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, and those permits are not uh, easily given or gotten. Um, so, you know, for all intents and purposes, this, this section around the stream is undevelopable. Uh, and then further to the, e on the eastern side of the property is uh, a wooded lot that is outside of the wetlands area. So theoretically would be developable. Um, and then beyond the property to the east, you can see the entryway from Route 62. The, the access road that goes into uh, where Walmart is now. Uh, so that's a general overview of the property. Um, what uh, the town of Berlin is looking at developing this land around the mall and Walmart uh, into a multi-use new town center uh, which would be a mixed use commercial residential. I think they have a medical center planned in there. And up here, uh, they're planning to put in municipal offices, uh, which is, and, the, and these images are all in the packet. Um, I'm looking at exhibit one now, uh, the detail, you can see that the entryway that's in the plans is that same entryway going into the Walmart, but it would be straightened out and connect into a grid of new roads that would be part of this new town center. Um, and on the, on the left side of here, where, where the school property is, would be municipal buildings and uh, recreational area. Um, so, this is what you know what exists now and what the plan uh, is for the town and so the town is basically asking the district to convey a portion of the school property to the town uh, to do this development and from what i understand and uh, there may be someone at this meeting from the town who could speak on behalf of the town but from what it, what i understand uh, there's two reasons why the town wants this property. First, um, they've outgrown their existing municipal offices and so they, they do need a new, uh, new space. Uh, and second, with this uh, development that they're planning, 
they're they're getting a formal new town designation which is a formal designation under vermont statutes uh, which creates a little bit of a fast track for development and also gives uh allows them to create a tax a new tax district and create tax incentives to also assist with that development um, so you know the the bottom line question um, for the school district uh, and for the board is whether to convey this eastern portion of the property to the town so that they can uh, you know to facilitate this development um, and there's there's two possible scenarios in this memo. One of them shows a 7.4 acre piece of the property to the east, you know, from the stream east, which would include a portion of the wetlands that could be conveyed to the town. And then in exhibit two in the memo, alternatively is a 3.8 acre piece, which excludes the wetlands. So the, the school district would keep the wetlands uh, and the portion to the east of that would be conveyed to the town and that would be the developable portion. Um, so, uh, and, and part of the backdrop for this as well um, is the, uh, the Articles of Agreement, which I think folks are uh, generally familiar with. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm just gonna pull those up. Um, so under Article 6B, um, the school board has the prerogative and the discretion to decide uh, not to, to, to cease using school property, buildings or land for school purposes. And if it does that, then under the articles, this, the district is required to convey that property back to the town that it came from in exchange for $1. Um, okay. And so what that does is it, it means that, um, one, you can't sell it to anyone else unless the town doesn't want it. But two, it takes the question of um, what's the price tag off the table because the price tag is already in the Articles of Agreement. Um, so the real question for the, for the board, again, is uh, should we convey this property? Uh, if so, how much do we convey the, a smaller portion or a bigger portion? Um, another thing to think about are, is if, if we do convey it, should there be conditions on that conveyance? Uh, do we convey it and say that they have to plant a vegetative buffer? Uh, do they have to agree that this property will only be used for municipal purposes for a certain period of years? Um, do they uh, have to maintain or have some agreement regarding the network of trails that goes through there? And, and you as a board and, and the community members know this property better than I do. And so you can be creative with this and come up with what, you know, what kind of conditions might be uh, reasonable and beneficial to the district. Um, and the one, the one other question that I have is whether there's any bond restrictions on uh, conveying this property. Um, it does say in the Articles of Agreement that if the district conveys a property out back to the town, the property is conveyed together with any bonded debt that's associated with that property. And I understand there is bonded debt on the Berlin Elementary School, but I don't know if conveying just the portion of that undeveloped property would affect the bonded debt. I don't know if the bond documents would uh, put any restriction on conveying this portion of property. 
And so that's something for the, the board to go back and look at those bond documents, see if there's any restrictions um, and see if, you know, some of, I don't know if some of that bonded debt would be conveyed to the town with the with the piece of land. Um, so that's that's the general overview and the things for the board to think about. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions beyond that. Thank you, Nick. I, I think if we open it up to board members, I'm just going to ask a quick question to Suzanne because I don't know if you had a chance, Suzanne, to check in into the bond uh, to the bank about the bond yet. I did a little uh, preliminary work. I talked to Virginia and Lori about it, and there's no specific bond associated with this, uh, the actual purchase of the property. And uh, Lori felt like, uh, based on her experience, that um, if there was no uh, development associated with with that property, that even if there was a bond associated, it would be allowed to go. It, that the restrictions are usually based on development on property. Uh, she also indicated that when the merger was completed, a really thorough um, uh, deed uh, review was done of all the properties in the district. And so we might have those uh, files. Uh, and so we have to locate those to, to take some closer look at that. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. So we'll look into that. So board members, if you have questions or have a specific request, I, I don't see any hands up yet, but I wanted to open up first to Vera because I know she has to step away. And I know you're on the phone, Vera. So if you're listening to me, could you please speak up? Hi, Floor. Hi, Vera. Go ahead. Um, so back in the spring, I went over for a site visit um, with the town administrator and the developer from the mall. And um, there are a couple of other people there. I was the only one that ended up showing up from the board because it was when it was opened up to the board members to go over for a site visit. So after that visit, um, and I decided, I took it all in, came back and pondered on my own thoughts. But I decided to put a message out to Berlin community members asking for their input on what what were their thoughts of that land and that this was the potential plan. And um, I received a lot of feedback and the majority of it, because it can be only conveyed back to the town for $1 with no benefit to the school, it was a large amount of no. They do not want to see that land conveyed over to the town. Um, so being that I feel I have my own mixed feelings about it and more sentimental feelings of that school land that was donated to the school from a family that had been in the town. Um, I would love to hear thoughts from the Clarks or uh, from Marsha or anybody in that family or so the Pikes. Um, but with what I heard from the town, I just, I feel like I'm working on behalf of our community and a large amount of our community was not in favor of doing that development or even conveying the, town, the land over to the town. So that's kind of my thought. Um, I'd be happy to share um, the comments that I got from people. I'd be happy to print them out and share them with everybody on the board so everybody can read all the comments for themselves. Like I said, that was back in April. So. Um, Thank you, Vera. I, I did invite the clerks to come today. I invite, I personally invited Marcia, sent her an email or ask her to give us a feedback via email. I, I'll double check again that I don't have something new from her. I'm gonna open it up. I see we have three board members, uh, McKaylin. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, Vera, thank you for that. Actually, my, so when I read through the proposal, you know, I'm, I'm not from Berlin. I'm not super familiar with the land. My first thought was, um, I didn't realize this had come up earlier in the spring as a new board member. I didn't know that. Um, my first thought was definitely um, community 
engagement is important here because, um, you know, the, I, I don't feel comfortable making that decision for the people of Berlin without having a sense that they're really on board. And the proposal we got referenced, um, you know, a couple surveys and votes that showed support for the development project, but not specifically for this land proposal. Um, so Vera, thank you for that information. And I'm wondering if it warrants, you know, another, some, some more community input. And then secondarily, if we do consider um, this, my inclination is to do the smaller amount um, of land because it doesn't make sense to me if the other part is kind of unusable, uh, why we would hand it over to the town if, um, I don't know, if they're not gonna use it, why not? Why wouldn't we ho hang on to it and kind of keep it safe? <laughs> So those are my two thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go on with the next board member, Chris McVeigh, you're not muted. Sorry, we have a lot of background noise. Oh, oh sorry. That's okay. Jonas and then Kari. So yeah, I also want to thank Vera for doing that outreach. Um, it puts us in a, in a little bit of a bind, right? Because the town of Berlin itself has supported this project right through the decades of work that have gone into it of all the money that I that they've put into development so far and into the proposal. It was a huge uh, win for them to get this approved by the state board, right, as a, as a new downtown and get the all the benefits that come that come with it. Um, so, you know, there's sort of an implicit support for the project from the town of Berlin. But what Vera's saying is is really concerning. Um, you, you know, I mean, first of all, I'd like to, you know, I agree with McCallan that if, if we're going to do this, we should do the smaller acreage. We should make sure that any, anything that affects the wetland there that requires mitigation would be there. You know, if we kept that land, that, that any mitigation for the wetlands that would have to be done as a result of the work that's being done would have to be paid for by them, right? And that we would, you know, we would not you know, have any liability for that. I would like a barrier between the development and the school land. I would like to keep the trails up. Um, you know, I, I would like to get, uh, you know, I would like if the town at some point decides to sell the land, right, if the, if the project fails, right, or if the buildings burn down in 30 years or something happens, they decide to sell the land, I would like it to be, you know, I would like there to be a clause in there that says that three point whatever acres goes back to the school district at the cost of one dollar. I don't want the district to have to pay for that again. Um, and I'd like to regain the land if something happens and it doesn't become useful for the development project. Um, but Vera, I, I, I want to ask a, a question. It, it seems from what you're saying that the the reason for the, the reasons that people gave for not supporting the land transfer is 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 a kind of a sentimental one right this land was given to the school right and it should be for for the school um can can you just describe you know and and lay out the reasons that people gave for not wanting the school to transfer this land and about how many people did you hear from sure so um i would have to go back if because I actually put it out like to my Berlin community members on Facebook. So the last time that I checked, and I haven't gotten any notifications that there's been any uh, more people that have commented recently, but there were probably like 35 to 40 that commented on just that post. But then I did some my own outreach, like with neighbors and just amongst other people when I would run into them at um, sporting events and stuff. So I would say in total, there was probably 75 ish community members that I specifically heard from either in writing or verbally. Um, and I do agree with you that there is definitely a, a sentimental piece to this, but I think the majority of what people, when as soon as they heard it can only be conveyed back to the town for $1 with nothing in return. And a lot of people were, they had the great ideas, like let's get some athletic fields, let's do something for, um, you know, an after school, like a park at the school separate from the playground. You know, there were a lot of other ideas that people threw out there to make it part of a deal, but it 
didn't sound like at that time that you could incorporate some of those items as part of the deal because the it's clearly in there that it can be conveyed for a dollar back to the town. So that was a lot of people's concerns was there's no money attached to the transaction that would gain the school or the district anything. So that was a huge part of it along with the sentimental piece. Thank you, Vera. Uh, Diane, uh, I see you, Tom, but I'm gonna go through the board members and then I'll let you speak. So one of the things that the question that came up, so um, the presentation from Nick and then, so I'm a little confused. There was a disconnect between what I'm hearing is that they have to own a part of this land in order for it to count. But yet when the question was posed, how would the project be impacted if they don't get it? They said um, that it would just mean that they would more than likely have to go to the mall to have a space at the mall and it would move away from being visible. So, you know, I think we're in a different world than when we started this conversation 25 years ago. I believe in the town center, but I don't believe that we should build and build and build when we have a three quarter empty mall. And so my concern as a Berlin resident um, is I just, I'm not seeing the need to donate this, this land. And so if to me, it's not a pressing need to donate it that uh, I just don't feel I need to even consider regardless of whether or not it's a good deal or not a good deal or what happens. To me, it's, I just don't understand the need for it when there's ample space without that seven acres. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Vera, is that a new hand? Otherwise, I'm yes. going to let Tom respond. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, so nobody at this point has heard from Marsha Clark. Is that correct? Not the town either from that you know of. I, I invited her. Let, let's, I sent her an email uh, about the meeting and to ask her to send some 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 input. And I, I also think uh, I'm, I'm going to let first uh, Tom answer the question. But the response, the simple response to that is no, Vera. I we okay. I, I haven't heard. Okay, thank you. Laura, Laura, I'd like to offer some comments as well before Tom speaks. If there are okay. no other board members, have their hand up. I, I have Jonathan, and then you can go. And I know Maggie. Okay. Oh, sorry, Maggie. I see your hand. I was not seeing that little hand there. So Jonathan, Just Maggie, so you know when and all then the hands you. are done. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess my main concern with this whole idea is, um, first of all, it's not walkable at all, um, and to me, that's almost uh, a deal breaker right off the bat because in many small towns in Vermont, you can walk in and around the town center. You can, it's accessible um, for people in wheelchairs, et cetera. And I don't see any of that happening, frankly, uh, in that location. And beyond that, if we were to donate any of the land I certainly would not be in favor of donating the entire seven acre parcel uh, when, you know, when wetlands uh, are under assault in many places in Vermont, that, that land needs to be protected. And when the town suggests that it has no value uh, because it can't be developed, it has value just because it's land. It has value on its own. It doesn't have to have a monetary value to be valuable. That that's just a that's just a construct of capitalism, and and that you know it's a throwback to land is not valuable unless it has monetary value. That's absurd. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah. Maggie. I would just second what Jonathan said about the value of the land. And, and I don't see in the um, Berlin Town Center questions really anything that speaks specifically to the environmental impact. Um, but largely, my concern is the second point on that 
um, town center question about the absence of a plan for any rent controlled or section eight housing when we have a significant housing crisis in our county um, that affects our kids. Um, that would be something, you know, that I'd like to see some kind of statement on rather than just we haven't made a plan for it. Um, Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Tom, after all. Oh, no, sorry, Chris first and then Tom. Okay. Um, so these are going to be a question to Nick in part. Um, and and um, I, I think I agree with Diane that if this land con conveyance is not necessary for the project to go forward, it's just necessary that, that the town offices be located within the project itself. It doesn't require that this land uh, be conveyed in order for that to happen. Um, the I would agree with the comments that if if we're going to do this at all, um, the smaller parcel would be the one uh, that should be which should be done. Uh, and Jonas hit on a point that I was going to make, which is um, if this happens, we should have a condition that the land and any development on it would revert back. To the school district, if the um, muni municipality of Berlin uh, decided to discontinue its use, um, Nick's memo seems to indicate that it would be a um, a fee simple conveyance, and that the, the town could then do whatever they wanted with it and and sell it to someone else if they wanted. Um, I would not be in favor of that, and uh, I would want it, the land to revert back to us, including any developments if it was required. Uh, I also want to comment on Article 6. Um, that, the, at least the language that Nick re, um, read, seemed to indicate that if the, if the school district decided it was no longer going to use the land for a school purpose, that it would be reconveyed to the town for a dollar. Um, you know, it, I don't know if that's what we're doing here. We're not deciding that when we don't need this land anymore. We're going to stop educational purposes on it. Um, we're acquiescing possibly to a request from the town of Berlin, which is a little different scenario than what I think Article 6 uh, was envisioned to um, address. I think that was envisioned to address that if a school closes um, and the town school is no longer going to be used for educational purposes, then, then the reversion to the town uh, would happen uh, for a dollar. Um, so, um, thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. I, Ursula, and then I promise Tom, you're next. Um, I wanted to speak to something Jonathan said in that it looks like they have a plan or a proposed multi-use path. I don't know if you meant more of a walkable um town center like if you're thinking like a downtown area walking all around but it looks like there's a proposed walking path i don't know if that met your needs or desires for a walkable area um i also wanted to hear maybe from aaron or somebody from the school about any impacts that the conveyance of the land would have like negative or positive to the school or any viewpoints that he has Thank you, Ursula. I'm gonna let it, Aaron, if that's okay. I'm gonna let just Tom respond to that. And then, cause I think we, we would all, and then I'm gonna let you tell it from the kid's perspective too, which would be important. Uh, Tom? Try to unmute. I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you uh, everyone for having us. Uh, I don't know if I could share a screen, but if, if I could, uh, there is really two phases to this project. The, the, the first immediate phase is when Nick uh, pulled up his map, uh, you saw the, the curved road that comes off of 62 that, that goes into, Ber uh, into the Berlin Mall area. Uh, it, that road, if you travel it, it can, speeds can be excessive and and we feel a need to really 
calm the traffic there. Uh, and so what we would do is would, would be realign that road into almost a, a T intersection. And, and that piece of the road would go over school property. So that's, that's the first piece of it. The, the second piece of it uh, is uh, that it would allow the development of uh, at least two, two buildings. Uh, uh, both have a residential aspect to it. Um, uh, we envision the municipal offices as a first floor and we see um, uh, multi-floor uh, uh, residential units on, on top of it. And so what, what I think what the school gets and ultimately the town gets and, and the town of Berlin gets out of this is if in the original, if you remember the original map that Nick showed, it was, you know, it's a, it's a 118 acre development that we have. And, and we, we put an estimate that that will bring to the grand list to the town of Berlin, about $125 million. And so that's an increase of 25% to the town of Berlin's grand list. The school, and the supervisor union are uh, receive revenues from a grand list uh, uh, development. And so there's, there's no doubt in my mind that the school, the town, the Berlin elementary school would prosper through this tax revenue as would the rest of your communities in this district. I don't know if anybody could point to in the next 10 years, a project that's going to bring $125 million of grand list value to any community. Um, and in addition to that, if, if the buildings that were on that uh, on display, 80% of them are residential buildings. So we're anticipating 60 to 80 students coming to Berlin Elementary School. Uh, uh, Central Vermont is is a, an area that's desperate for housing. Um, and and, and it's, it's just a critical need for it. And, and if, if, you, if you look closer at the, the road development uh, and the block development, it all includes paved sidewalks. So it's, it's completely pedestrian friendly. Um, it, that's that's the, one of the main items of a downtown designation that it, it has to be pedestrian oriented. And someone mentioned that we also included a multi-use path around it. And so that is included, but believe you me, there will be paved sidewalks on every, every road that's being developed here. And that's throughout the, the, the course of, of this, this development. So, so Berlin lacks a traditional downtown. Right, it just does, and and the 25 years ago, our community recognized that to um, uh, the need for a space for the constituency to gather, to meet, to recreate, uh, because it's it's been missing in our town. That's 25 years ago, and there was a plan developed. The plan called for development of this of uh, a new town center in the ball and. Uh, centering around the Berlin Mall campus. Um, in, in 2015, uh, uh, the planning commission really took up that, uh, that, that uh, torch and have had series, numerous uh, public meetings, bond votes. Uh, our, our town plan that was adopted in 2000, 2018 clearly said was centered around having a new town center. And the vote was overwhelmingly in support of that. Uh, we've had numerous bond votes that brought infrastructure in around the new, new town center. They were overwhelmingly approved by our constituency. So um, I, I can appreciate the sentimentality of, of uh, maybe a concern, uh, but there's always two sides of the story. And, and, uh, uh, and I, I believe at, at the end of the day, the, 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 the Berlin Elementary School, the Washington Center Supervisor Union, and the town of Berlin will be better off for this project. 
Yeah, I, I just do. There's there's a green space is baked into the this project. Um, but again, uh, I, what 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 I would really like to do is is it's very difficult to 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 show these items to folks, especially over a, a Zoom platform. You know, we we uh, invited the, the board out this spring with with some success. Uh, I, I I truly believe if you if we could 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 meet and talk about the merits, I think at the end of the day you all would agree that this is beneficial for all parties involved. So, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just one question that was asked uh, by Diana, several board members, and maybe you could uh, uh, answer for us. Is like, is, is this, uh, is your development, a, uh, is it a deal breaker for us to not uh, provide the land? Without your land, we cannot calm the traffic coming into that facility. So um, I, I- Okay. I, so is, answer, that, yeah, yeah, is yeah. that it? Is that it? And, and, you don't need it for funding or for- So, so we have received a, a $500,000 grant to, to um, realign that road, uh, but it's conditioned on realigning it. And, and so, um, again, it's, it's dollars coming into our community that do not have to come from, from municipal tax dollars. So, so Flora, I don't, I don't mean to be rude, but I do want to state that just because I'm saying I'm not for us conveying that land does not mean I'm not for this development. I have trouble believing that this whole development weighs on a potentially three and a half acre. I realize that you're saying that's going to help straighten the road. I think we need to figure out another one, but I don't want this painted that I'm saying I'm not for this conveyance because I'm not for the town center because that's not accurate at all. Nobody would say we don't want more kids in our building. We don't want more funding in our towns. Um, I just don't understand the complexities of conveying that land over how it's going to make a big difference. That's why I think having a face-to-face -face discussion uh, is the best way to, to achieve that end. Yeah, and I apologize, but the other problem that happened with that face-to-face -face visit is I'm a school employee and it was right at the end of school in May and I couldn't do it. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I think we had a new question I'm, from a couple I'm, of, but hold on a minute. Uh, Vera had a comment and then I wanna really have Aaron give it, you know, that feedback from the school. Vera, go ahead and then I'm gonna have Aaron and then you can go, Chris, after that. Yeah, mine right. is real quick. I just wanna, I 100% agree with Diane. I am not against the development. I just, I feel like we as a, we as a board need to, um, include our town and do some type of a town meeting to hear from other people in our town. I mean, what I heard from is a small group and I really feel like this is one of those outreach times. We as a board need to set up a special meeting to have the community input for, for the whole board to hear. Thank you, Vera. I'm gonna let Aaron go, Jonathan, and then uh, Jonathan, John, uh, Jonas, and then I'm gonna take you and Chris, okay? Uh, Aaron, please. Thank you. I, I do really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to have a voice here for a moment. Um, so I will give a principal perspective, obviously, and just a little bit overall. I, I too feel that uh, what's been said about um, the, the value of having an improved community, this, this, this center, um, like Tom said, all the positives. Um, of course, I agree with that. I think, you know, it will, will, will bring more to the town, more value, um, and hopefully, you know, a, an increased student population. Um, uh, I think that's would obviously be fantastic. Um, in terms of the, the, the property itself and knowing what goes on along that nature trail, um, you know, looking at the map, the trail um, starts at the southern end of that parking lot is where it, uh, one of the, the entrances is. And it, it weaves uh, back and forth along that, that, that stream. Um, 
and a good portion of it on the on the on the right side or the west or east side of of, of that stream and comes all the way um the other entrance is at the northern part of the property where that that field kind of lips into the into the right there um, it's utilized a lot uh, by many classes throughout the whole year um, so when this came to my attention a couple of years ago um, you know of course i immediately thought you know what does this mean for people in the community like feeling they could just come in and out pretty freely to the berlin property you know what would it mean for people coming on to like the playground in the middle of the day um, and then as I saw plans develop, it seemed like you know that would be limited. Um, I think looking at the, the picture, there's a, um, a piece that says, you know, future, what does it say? Future, uh, future path to school. Um, you know, part of me was thinking, does that mean that folks would kind of feel welcome to, to come to the trail area? Uh, what would that mean for kids during the day? That would be a little bit odd. Um, at the same time, if students were to then be living in this housing, would this be a nice, you know, place for students to be able to walk home, you know, and be a, a, a walker versus having to ride a bus or, or a car. Um, so I see that part as potential piece as well. Um, uh, so those are, those are my thoughts um, about this. I, I do agree too that, you know, if it were anything, the 3.8 versus the whole seven <laughs> is better. Um, and I think just finally, you know, through this process, I wasn't sure. I'm like recalling back if if the if this issue was a bit of an oversight. Um, I thought at one point it was discussion like, is there a realization that it's that these plans are going on to school property and I think maybe that was missed I'm not sure and now that's why we're talking about it now but um, I'm recalling that somewhere as well so um, those are my thoughts thanks Aaron uh, Jonas and then Chris oh, sorry Chris first and then Jonas you've been waiting Chris um you know I'm just not sure it's worth me taking the time okay uh, so I, just two follow-ups. Yeah, two follow-ups for Tom. Tom, I don't think you. Uh, I'd like to get some a clear answer on whether, if the district did not convey this land, whether it would be a deal breaker uh, for the um, the town center project. I think it, it it that's a tough question to answer. I I think it could be a deal breaker for that end of the end of it. Um, there, there is a, we're under perm, a permit review for a 30 unit housing uh, unit that's being constructed across from, when you, if you go out there, if anybody's been out there, there's a 98 unit senior housing project being developed now. Um, yep. I, I, I believe if the road alignment does, would not come to fruition, we would lose that um, housing, that 30 unit housing complex we would lose the capability of any additional housing on that end of end of the property, and uh, and Aaron, you are correct that the the note on on the that map was for the the, the children living in the, those neighborhoods created by the new town center to get to and from the Berlin Elementary School. It, it you know it wasn't a meant to be a thoroughfare for for um, you know just the mass mass public. It was a way for kids to get back and forth from school and without having to take a bus. It just lends to that notion of, the, again, the walkability of, of this project. Um, uh, so it, did we, the Planning Commission have any contingency plans on straightening the road in a different manner if the conveyance was not made? You, you can't get a 90 degree road um there is there is no other way to do it if you, if, if, you, if the map could be brought up again or I, I i i could share my screen with you but the um it, it's it's just there is no other way to to do it um without serious 
impacts to wetlands, which would never be approvable. Kari. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Floor. So um, obviously this is a pretty complex um, uh, issue and I just wanted to share the way I, I'm thinking about this is to kind of back up and think about interests um, in, in terms of, um, you know, what are the different groups that are involved here and what are their interests in this project? And um, I can think of at least three groups. There's the interests of the district of which we are the, the, the board that has to determine what those interests are and what we want to do. There's obviously the town of Berlin, and then there's all the other citizens of our district. Um, might be a might be a distinct uh, group as well. I was hoping that at this meeting that we would at least get some clarity on what we believe as a board our interests are as a district. And I can I can see four. Um, a couple um, really straightforward ones are. We want the use of the trails. We've been using those and we want to continue using those. That seems like something that we can, we would be able to, to um, build into an agreement. We also have an interest in maintaining some sort of buffer, whether that's for safety or for visual or noise barrier. We want to maintain that. And uh, I think that that's probably doable, whether it's three and a half or seven, we can, we can talk about that. Um, the other two are, I guess, maybe less straightforward. Um, one is that I, I came into this thinking that we want to support this development of a downtown uh, Berlin downtown center for all the reasons that Tom um, uh, stated. It, it Ultimately, for us as a district, it's going to mean more students. It's going to be more students in quality housing. And there also is a bonus going to be close to these students are going to be close to our school. They could even actually even walk there. So the, those things um, and, and um, greater greater tax revenue. Um, so all of those things make me think that this development in general is in our interests and, and we want to support it. You know, we're talking about this incremental uh, uh, piece of property and how that supports the the overall development, those are good questions, but I think in general, to, to my way, of, we have an interest in supporting this development. And the fourth thing is, is less clear to me now than I, I was surprised, um, well, that the fourth thing is that we want to foster a good relationship with the town of Berlin. We, you know, we are Berlin, you know, part of us is Berlin. Uh, we, we have overlapping interests there. And I would have thought coming into this, um, and, and this was substantiated in that some of that survey data or the, uh, some of the polling data, um, voting data that was in the packet, that the citizens of Berlin generally support this project and they've been voting for it and, and, um, and expressing interest in it. So I was surprised to hear some of the comments, um, you know, Vera's, um, um, you know, what she's been gathering from people and then, you know, all three of the uh, Berlin board members are expressing concern ab about, about this. So I, I think we have to unpack that. We have to understand that a little bit better. Um, we certainly don't want to do something that goes counter to the interests of Berlin, um, but it's, that, that part is not clear to me. So anyway, I'm going to stop there. I, I just wanted to, to share the way that I'm thinking about this, and hopefully that's helpful. Thank you, Carrie. That, that is that is very her, uh, helpful. I think that we can put it in, in categories. I, I had some similar categories. Uh, so I had urban development, uh, so division, and that includes the trails and the buffer. Legal clause, I heard a lot from uh, you guys about this property being able to come back to us if it stopped being used by the time for the same amount. And then the last one is the community engagement that I agree with you, Carrie, that I thought that had been done already, but it looks like we should go out at least once to our, to our community and put this out to them and make sure that like, like Carrie said, you know, we're all Berlin too. If I take my chair and hat off, I, I, you know, I came into this meeting the same way thinking that we, you know, as, urban development and the construct of our cities are really important and uh, having a downtown which I know all of the board members uh, support is something that brings a better sense of community to our kids 
in in Berlin that ability to to walk and to you know connect and create community by the built environment. It's important that school is very isolated the way it is. We have a lot of schools downtown Montpelier, right? You can walk right next to the school and there's no no problem. The sense of community that this will create will be will be huge. So I, without having the important input from the community, uh, I, I was feeling that, you know, let's do everything we can to support this project and maybe do the smaller, uh, the, the smaller part of it. So I, I think we have agreement. Let's go into a community, uh, let's try to figure out a, a way to have a community engagement with the look a little, do a little bit more research into the bond, the, the three questions that were asked to, to, to make sure that we have the deed, the bond, and any other legal questions that we can ask uh, uh, Nick. And then my suggestion would be that we do uh, a community engagement, but we, we invite the town to, unless there's opposition to that so that we can have the drawing so that it could be a way to all get the same feedback. Is, would that be okay? So we're not creating our own separate, uh, and now Stephen is gonna put everything into clarity for us. Thank you, Stephen. Um, what, I'm in agreement with, it, with everything, um, particularly as it was, um, clarified by Kari. Um, and I think the missing piece is how does the how do how do residents of Berlin feel about this school property being deeded back to the town? Um, and my hope would be that um, Thomas and others from the town hear that and um, so Floor, I'll exp express um, an interest in having a survey done and not a community meeting. Because at a community meeting, we're gonna hear from 50 or 75 people. Um, and I wanna know from you know, hundreds of people in Berlin what they think, um, which I think a survey um, would be able to do that. But what I, what I hear from everyone tonight is a willingness, but there's some reservation because as board members, we're not sure how the residents of Berlin feel about the school board deeding this land back to the town. Not the project, not the town center project, but the specific question of how do they feel about the, this land being deeded back to the town. That, that is a great idea. We we can send a survey. We can send a survey out. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Nick? Otherwise, I'm going to move us uh, along. And you know, I don't see any other hands up. So, it, Vera, is that a new hand, or can we move? Um, that must be an old hand. I'll put it down. Okay. Thank you, Nick, for joining us today. <laughs> I think you have a good sense of our questions, and we'll I'll make sure to connect back with you and Jen. Thanks for having me, and I'll be on standby. Okay. Thank you. So let's move into the into five finance. We're a little behind of where I wanted us to be. So let's look at the budget process, that draft timeline that, that we sent you, and we're looking for uh, some input on that. It's on page 16. Flora, can I frame this conversation quickly? Yeah. Um, so I think that one thing that is important to think about as we consider the overall process and the timeline is that Way back when I was in uh, leadership training 101, I learned that the um, budget should tell a story. If it was words instead of numbers, it should tell a story of what's important to us, what our values are. And, um, and so that we're hoping that this process and timeline will allow all of us to engage in a process that helps us um, ensure that the budget is a reflection of our values 
and the needs of our students. So earlier we talked about the idea of that community forum in October, really grounded in our implementation plan, our theory of action. And, um, and so I hope that as you engage in this conversation, um, you, will, you will consider that lens. Um, and I don't know, uh, Fleur, if you want Suzanne to do a quick overview of, that, of the process or timeline, or if you prefer that uh, we just engage in questions since it was in the packet. Either way, Suzanne is prepared to say yeah, that. I, I was I, I was hoping that for this one, Suzanne, we could just engage in questions. People, you know, it was it, people had time to to look at it and and see if it's enough, if it's too if it's too little. We we made some some small changes on it, but it's pretty. We're, we're looking for ideas and Diane. So I know, especially like under special ed funding in that there are changes coming down the road, if those things could be highlighted as to potential impact, um, but then also uh, that the balancing of how we've used ESSER funds and how those will be kind of weaned off. So that's informational part of those stories. So if we could have that information, that would be great. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I don't see any, but if, you know, in the, in, in N on, on number two, if you, you know, it, part of telling the story, like Jen was saying, those, uh, the, the board establishing the parameters, that's sort of what we were brainstorming. So that is a good part in for other community members to, to hear. So we're thinking implementation plan that we already have from 2016 to 2021, just check and see where we are on that. Our board goals, other initiatives, so we can still be creative. This is not set on stone. A moving forward plan, the moving forward plan has three pillars. It's on the website, please visit it. In the ESSER front grants, we would keep that in mind and also try to be flexible with that. So that summarizes that, that part, unless there's other questions, I would like to move on. So if we could, is that okay, Jen? You guys feel okay with that? Okay, I'm just trying to gain a little time here. So for your information, we, we started uh, at the finance committee, we had this conversation. And so accomplishments and issues, transportation committee and copier bid were put in there for your information. I'm wondering if you have some questions related uh, to them. Otherwise we can do a quick overview, but I don't, they were pretty, clear in there but you know we had a chance to discuss as a finance committee i'm also happy to have a, a suzanne or mike talk about the copier bid but otherwise we could move into the action items any questions the board feels comfortable with the three above i'm seeing nodding heads and the people on the phone i can't see you so i'm assuming you're okay so let's let's move to the U32 van lease on page 26. And Suzanne, go ahead. You're here with us. I don't want to cut you off on any. Go ahead and let's let's talk a little bit about this one and then we'll move into the next one. Sure. Uh, the Chrysler Pacifica van lease from Midstate Chrysler for the special ed van at U32 ends on September 30th. Uh, as we, as many of us probably know, new and used car inventory right now is very limited. Uh, the van is a 2019, it's in very good shape with only 10,995 miles. The buyout cost uh, for the van is $18,917.50. There is eight, <clears throat> excuse me, $8,781.99 remaining in the FY22 budget for a lease. Uh, using this money for the purchase, this leaves $10,135.51 unbudgeted. The expense would be eligible for a 56% SPED reimbursement this year. Uh, any purchases like that after this year would not be eligible for a 56% reimbursement as Diane was uh, discussing about the Act 173 special ed financing change which leaves a balance of $4,459.62 unbudgeted. 
Uh, staff recommends the board move to approve the purchase of the 2019 Chrysler Pacifica van currently on lease from Midstate Chrysler. Total purchase amount $18,917.50. Thank you, Suzanne. The, the Finance Committee also was in agreement and recommended this. Could, could we have a motion? Somebody make a motion? I, I will move. move. Purchase. Go ahead. Yeah, I move that we purchase the, uh, approve the purchase of the 2019 Chrysler Pacific, Pacifica van currently on lease for the total purchase of $18,917.50. Second. Jonas, okay, Jonas, second. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the motion as read by Diane, please say aye. 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 I thank you, Maggie. Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Okay. So let's move right into the appointment of the new third party. Uh, Suzanne. Uh, sure. Uh, VHI, the trust company that the school district purchases our employee health insurance through, offers, <clears throat> excuse me, four different vendors for their third party administration of HSAs, HRAs, and FSAs. Uh, the VHI third-party administrator vendor comparison chart was uh, provided to all of you. Um, since January, our payroll staff has had correspondence with 45 employees regarding issues with their HRA accounts, which are currently administered by DataPath. The resolution of employee issues requires significant staff time. Uh, each one requires correspondence with the employee, correspondence with DataPath, correspondence with Blue Cross, uh, possible uh, information that's very private being shared with our staff that normally we wouldn't need to have that type of information shared with us. Uh, Blue Cross does not provide DataPath with a direct eligibility feed for our employees. Uh, this has been identified by staff as the primary struggle with DataPath's claim system. The only third party administrator that receives direct eligibility feed from Blue Cross is a company called My Money Slash Further. Uh, additional comparisons of vendor services reveals that the employee login to My Money Further uh, is directly through the Blue Cross website. So employees would go to the Blue Cross website find the link to my money and sign uh, directly into their account. So it's that uh, really nice one-stop shop uh, portal. And my money further offers free open enrollment support. And uh, additionally, and I, I'm almost hesitant to even talk about it because really this uh, proposal is uh, significantly surrounding uh, employee service. So customer service for our employees. Um, but additionally, the vendor fees uh, per employee per month are less with my money further. Um, and so uh, this switch would uh, save staff time in, in uh, the fiscal services department, but it would also in, improve uh, satisfaction with our employees and the third party administrator. Um, Jen brought this proposal to uh, labor management and the, the union was in support of this transition. And staff recommends that the board move to appoint my money further as the WCUUSD third party administrator for HSAs, HRAs and FSAs effective January 1, 2022. Thanks Suzanne. Uh, the finance committee also had the same recommendation. Uh, can I have a motion please? I will move that the board appoint my money further as the WCU USD third party administrator for HSAs, HRAs and FSAs effective January 1, 2022. Um, and if there's a second, I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, I'll second it. It's Lindy. Lindy. Yeah, so I just want to say like the, the cost reduction here is a, a, a nice to have. I want to make sure health insurance and everything around paying for healthcare costs is an absolute nightmare everywhere in this country. So I wanna make sure that we are doing this with the 
right? The stated intent of making things better and easier for people who are trying to get benefits and the people who are administering those benefits and the cost saving is, is, is just sort of a nice thing. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Stephen? And I would also like, uh, it's stated in the minutes um, that we appreciate the feedback from the union and um, understand their endorsement of moving to this um, new vendor. Thank you, Stephen, very important. Okay, uh, if there's not any other questions, uh, all those in favor of approving the motion as made by Jonas, please say aye. 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 You're all ayes, any opposed? Any abstain from the Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let's move to six, consent agenda. We have some minutes to approve. Any motions? I will move, move to approve. Yep. Chris, go ahead. Go ahead, Jonas. Chris, Jonas, go ahead. And I'll second. I'll second, Jonas. I'll move to approve the minutes of August 11th, <laughs> August 25th, and September 1st, contingent on any corrections of Lindy's name. Okay. <laughs> Jonas and Chris with a slight amendment. All those in favor of approving the minutes with that slight change, please say hi. Yeah, let's get my name right. Yeah. <laughs> aye. 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 Okay, I hear all ayes. Any opposed? Hearing none, let's move on. Uh, approval orders, Lindy. I've got to get them where I can see them. When I just clicked, they disappeared. Um, yeah. I've got the ones for 819 in the, I'd like to make a motion to approve the board order of um, 819 in the amount of $863,404.74. Thank you, Lindy. Have a second? Second. Thank you, Ursula. Lindy and Ursula. Any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, hearing none, the motion carries. Lindy, is, is that it? No. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's the other one. Um, this one. Yeah is the July 22nd through August 18th. I think that, is that the same one I just did? No. Uh, this, uh, make a motion to approve this board order in the amount of $898,160.19. Thank you. A second to that? Uh, can I ask for clarification? I'm looking at two Wait, boards. Hold, hold on one second. I just need a second. First. Second. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah. Okay, go ahead with your question, Chris. So, yeah, the, um, what was the one that we just authorized? We um, just, that one was 819. I said 819, but it was 819 through 915. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Withdraw. That's why. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye before I put you all to sleep. You guys are yawning already. Aye. 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 Okay. Lindy, should I change the date? You said 819 through what? I should probably change. Um, 915. Through 915. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The ayes appear to have it, so the motion carries. Um, Lindy, I don't want to put you on the spot again, but let's move on to personnel or if somebody else has oh, personnel. I know I have that one open. Put it. Yeah, go ahead. I'm navigating my screens here. Um, make a motion to accept the appointment of Karen Chesser for Berlin Guidance Counselor at 1.0 FTE. Thank you, Lindy. Could I have a second for Karen? Second. Thank you, Jonas. Any questions, discussions? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor? 
Please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And then we, we didn't have any retirement. Any Anything new, Jen, that we should know? Nothing. No, nothing new right now. We're, we have a, um, a position that we posted, which is a part-time um, professional development and assessment coordinator. The posting date ended today. And um, we are still working on some key vacancies that I made you all aware of in the community letter as well. Um, so hoping to, to fill some key positions still. Thank Good you. Luck. Okay, we're um, two minutes behind schedule, but if you would allow it, I have a really quick report from, uh, from the Career Center. Uh, is that okay? So uh, sure. Jody, Jody wrote a, a small piece uh, on the paper, I, and I'll try to send that to, to all of you, but the committee itself is going to have the last review at our next board meeting on Tuesday on, um, on, on the report itself. So we're gonna to try to schedule a, uh, a time for, for Jody to come visit uh, us and we'll make sure to have that report for you, for you in October or November. The hope is to have this voted in March, which is a little bit accelerated timeline from what we had first said. So I just wanted to put it on your radar that the, the change of governance for the Career Center is coming. If you have uh, any questions, please feel free to send a, an email. It, we'll be sending you it, with plenty of time, but we are one of the sending districts. So I wanna put that in your radar for, because we're gonna be doing budgeting at the same time that this is happening. It, and then the second, the, the last report I, I had is just, I know that sometimes you get a lot of emails from the, so moving on to VSBA and I'll be really quick. It, sometimes you get a lot of emails from, from us in the weekly newsletter and sometimes we do not open them all, but I just wanted to make you aware that the last email, it was a combined statement by the VSBA, Vermont uh, Superintendents Association and the Vermont Principals Association, a statement on critical race theory a lot of our school boards are dealing with this conversation. It's a really important piece of information for all of you to be aware. I don't want to take the time to read the whole statement here, but I did want you to make sure to take the time to read it. And that concludes our business for today. So could have a motion to adjourn. Well, actually, we should do the board reflection before we adjourn. <laughs> Any comments from the board? But isn't there also public comments again? Oh, you're right. Yes. Or. Yeah, but we have board reflection um, first. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll volunteer to write another summary of this meeting for Front Porch Forum, uh, unless someone else wants to do it. But uh, does anybody have um, specific topics that they'd like covered in the update? Kari. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just make sure to put an update um, about the Berlin land, please. Of course. Like highlight. Yeah, and I think you might mention that you know, that you know the board would be interested in hearing any you know comments or feedback from the people of Berlin. Sure. And that we intend on sending out a survey. And Kari, our. Um... Uh, the efforts that the administration is making in terms of COVID-19 and the efforts that our staff is making and the appreciation for them uh, in their efforts to keep our kids safe as well. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll make a comment on reflection. Um, I think that we are, regarding Berlin, we are in a strange place um, where we are there, there seem to be two competing set of, of, of opinions about this, right? And it's a strange place for the board to be in the middle of what is town business. Um, you know, I think we wanna do what's best for the school district first, then I think we wanna do what's right for the community. And um, it's just, it feels uncomfortable to be in the middle of this. Thank you, Janice. 
Any other board reflections? Lindy? Yeah, I, I thought the tone and pace of the meeting, uh, people had enough time, but then as we needed to move along, you did a really nice job of doing that. Um, so I just, I think that's a plus. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I was, if I self-reflect, I was feeling that I did not do such a great job, met, you know, really framing the Berlin conversation. I could have done a little bit more, but um, thank you for all of that reflection. Uh, I want to open it, uh, Dexter. I knew there were a couple of community members. Uh, and one reflection that I had also in the Berlin is that I wanted to give Chris O'Brien a chance to speak because he had two uh, really good uh, questions when we met and I did not give you <laughs> a chance to speak, Chris, so I apologize for, for that. That's but, okay. But we'll bring you up into uh, for, our next, uh, for our next meeting. Okay. Could we hear the questions now? Sure. Chris, do you want to go ahead or do you want me to share them? Yeah, I mean, my only, really only one concern I had was, you know, looking down the road 10 or 15 years, would we look back if we were to convey this to the town and had reservations about it down the road, like maybe we could have used that property for something for the school. And and I don't, you know, I don't live in the district, um, so I don't really have kids going to school in the district anywhere. Um, it's just an outsider's viewpoint. Um, and, and just looking out for, you know, not, not wanting to do something and, and regret it without really um, vetting it like we are now, so. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so community members, don't open it up to community input. Uh, please raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, yeah. Let me know. I know Dexter has his hand up and thank you for being patient, Dexter. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks. I, I really just um, started out with just uh, wanting to make some comments on the COVID policy. Um, two basic things. Uh, Jen was uh, promoting testing and participation in testing. And just an anecdotal experience that um, we've had is that uh, we had a uh, family friend test uh, positive. Uh, we believe it's a false positive. She was tested seven times and had one positive, uh, but did have close contact with uh, many people, caused a lot of other people to go out and get tested. Um, nobody got sick. She had a cold and got over it fairly quickly. Uh, she was retested four times after her positive, all negative. And, uh, you know, I just think that the test, you know, the testing is invasive, uh, can be invasive, uh, and it is dangerous uh, too. And just promoting that isn't necessarily the, uh, the best thing. So uh, I just thought that you might want to uh, consider that. And the other thing with the testing is I wonder if, if people come to school sick to get free testing and convenient testing. Um, again, making the testing available might be creating a problem uh, more than something else. And then the other thing I just wanted to offer, or I guess request, is that I'd like to be involved uh, more in the developing of the uh, new safety rules around COVID. And so I don't know if there will be public uh, opportunities for the public to engage in that process. And if there aren't gonna be public policies, I just would like to volunteer to engage with uh, Jen or Jen's designee uh, to assist in uh, developing any changes to the policy. And the third comment I had to make was uh, relative to the Berlin proposal, which wasn't anything I showed up for tonight, but it was certainly interesting. And I felt the most compelling testimony was that from the uh, principal uh, at the school who I believe said that that land is used uh, for nature trail now. And I just think that that's a, a really hugely valuable educational resource that should be preserved for the school. Those are my comments. And I guess my other comment is I, I you really need to work on your public comment policy. Uh, there's just not enough time in your once monthly meetings to have meaningful discussion. Um, I think my key example would be if this was the Berlin School Board meeting and they were talking about that land, there'd be a lot more public discussion 
in this meeting that would be valuable for you to hear uh, from the public in Berlin. Thanks. Thanks, Dexter. Uh, any other public comments? I don't. I don't see any other. I, I do see a message from 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 Maggie that you had a board reflection, but your internet was not working right. But I'm gonna wait on Jonas and 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 Maggie and let uh, Meg uh, speak, which is the other hand up. Welcome, Meg. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I would just like to add that I think it would be helpful to have more than just a survey regarding um, the Berlin property. Um, I think it would be great to have an opportunity for an informational night with both you know, the town community and the, the uh, proposers of the, the meeting and the survey, that's all. Thank just you. To get, just, to get the, just to get more people engaged because I think a lot of people will have no idea about what it looks like and sounds like even though you might have advertised um, some of that information already. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, Maggie, you had a board reflection. I don't. Um, I, I yeah. just was considering that you know these estimates on how many students would potentially be attending Berlin. I'm just curious where this, at the estimates are coming from, um, and because I'm hearing that as one of the reasons to support um, giving the town the land. Um, so I, I would just like more concrete data on how they, they came to these estimates, both for housing development and the number of students, um, especially considering that there's no information beyond that they're not going, they're not planning rent controlled or section eight housing. You know, who is this demographic that's going to be moving into these apartments? or housing? Is it is it condos? Is it apartments? Um, those are questions that I have as a, um, a board member. Thank you, Maggie. Feel free to send those uh, uh, to me and we'll make sure to, to start uh, to start a document. I'm looking for board reflections. Uh, I don't, I, I just want to make a clarification about uh, public comments uh, that we do not respond to public comments uh, in our board meetings. Uh, we can always get uh, back to them. Uh, so, uh, Jonas? Yes, Floor. I understand our policy. Um, I understand our policy, um, but I feel compelled to make sure that the community uh, knows that COVID testing is safe, that there is no danger to the students in getting tested. Um, and my son was out of school on Monday when, at, at Doty when surveillance testing is done. Uh, he stayed home that day and our awesome school nurse was in touch with me to ask if he would like to get tested anyway. And we conducted that test outside, out of the school in a safe way. Um, everyone should stay home when they are symptomatic, but I have firsthand experience that the district is doing what it can do to provide surveillance testing even to kids who are not in school that day. Thank you, Jonas, that's important. I don't see any other community members hands up. Uh, we've done with board reflection. I will look for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Move to adjourn. Thank you, Jonas. Could I have I a second? second? Everybody is, Diane, <laughs> you got it. Okay, all of those in favor, please say aye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for aye. being here. Aye. 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 See you next time. Aye. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Night. Bye. Record.